Hi, everyone. Welcome to another Q&A session. And uh, I think this is my third in this uh, second series of Q&A sessions. And let's get right to it. Now, I'm going to read off the Q&A questions on my screen here. And one thing, Suzanne, you asked the other day about uh, hyperfocal distance. And I love talking about hyperfocal distance. It's a little bit complex. So I'm going to really simplify it. Now, Usually, um, hyperfocal distance is something that is really near and dear to the hearts of landscape photographers, mainly because when we're dealing with landscape photography and we don't have the luxury of really technical um, tricks such as focus stacking, for example, and that's something that I talked about in the last video, we try to get as much depth of field as possible that the lens will allow. So for example, let's just say that we have beautiful flowers in front of the camera lens and we have a distant mountain. So the thing is, how do you get everything with sharp focus? Well, traditionally what we do is simply go to F22 or F32 if our lens allowed it. Now, um, I should say that maybe F16, F22, F32 would be usually the, the upper limit to having the maximum amount of depth of field possible in your picture to get those beautiful flowers and of course the distant mountain in the shot and good and sharp. Now the problem with that is that often the, the outer extremes of apertures, say for example f16, f22, or f32, f32 the, the sort of uh, the maximum f-stop number uh, is not always the absolute sharpest. Okay, now it's usually good and sharp, but the perimeter of the lens is sometimes not as good as you would hope. This is certainly the case with kit lenses and even, to be honest, with some professional lenses because I remember owning um, the Canon 50mm f1.2 and I was thinking, you know, I have an f1.2 lens, full frame camera. This is going to be amazing. But the f1.2 was almost unusable because the perimeter, like the perimeter, of, if this is the, the picture, the perimeter was soft. And this is really disappointing. Now, the middle section, like say, for example, my face, that was good and sharp with the f1.2. But what I'm trying to say is the extremes, like the lowest f-stop number, plus the highest f-stop number, they're often not as sharp in the perimeter as you would like. So hyperfocal distance is a really cool trick where um, you would focus, you would do something called pre-focus, you would focus on something that's one-third into the picture space, and that one-third would give you the maximum amount of depth of field uh, possible with regards to where you, you choose your, your focus. Now, let me, let me back up and explain. I'd like you to picture the, the beautiful flowers that are, let's just say they are three feet in front of you. And the, you want to get a, a, a wall, like a garden wall that's nine feet away from the camera, okay? So here we go. This is hyperfocal distance in a very simplistic way. We have uh, flowers that are three, free, three feet from your lens and we have a beautiful trellis or a beautiful wall with um, bougainvillea, how about? I, I'll choose that because I, I'm remembering Mexico right now. So nine feet away from the camera are the bougainvillea, it's the wall, and three feet in front of you are some nice flowers, okay? Now if you focus on the flowers which are three feet away from the camera lens, then you're getting the maximum um, value out of the depth of field. So you could be at f22, f16, or whatever the highest f-stop number is, and that will allow for a great amount of depth of field all the way up to your camera, all the way back to that trellis with the bougainvillea, okay? Now the reason I say this, I give these numbers, is because the 369 scenario is very easy to break up into thirds. So we want one Focus on that which is one-third distance into your picture space, and that will be quite valuable. Now let's just work on something that's 30 feet away. Let's just say that that trellis of bougainvillea, that wall, that garden wall, is 30 feet away from your camera. 
That means that you would focus on anything that is 10 feet in front of your camera lens, okay? Why is that? Because 10 feet out of a 30 feet distance is one third, okay? So you're with me so far? <clears throat> Again, we're, we're doing this to get the maximum depth of field in the picture. Now, what about, let's just say for fun, we go uh, our the wall, uh, the Bougainvillea trellis wall is 60 feet away from the camera, okay? We would simply take 60 divided by three, which is 20 feet, okay? And that 20 feet mark or distance away from your lens is where you're gonna focus. Now you could say, but Mark, what if there's nothing to focus on that's 20 feet away? Well, then just guess. Just pre-focus on anything on the ground that you think is roughly 20 feet away. This is hyperfocal distance in a really simplified form. Now, if there's any um, pro landscape photographers out there, I know that, that hyperfocal distance has so much more than this. I'm just trying to give a really simplified Q&A session here. So that will help you out. Now, the reason why I, I stated that sometimes the maximum f-stop numbers like f22, f32, f16, depending on the lens, is not always the best at the corners of the frame it, <clears throat> one thing that you could do is simply go to f8 or f11, which is really sharp, by the way, on the perimeter, so we, on the perimeter of your pictures, and simply use hyperfocal distance. And that should give you a good amount of depth of field sharpness throughout your picture space. Suzanne, that was an awesome question. And uh, I loved it. I love talking about hyperfocal distance. It's really good, not only for landscapes, but actually really good for architecture. If you're doing professional architecture work inside rooms, all you would do is just measure with a laser the depth of the room space. Okay, so let's get to another question. So Lana, Lana says, I find I have an advanced, sorry, <clears throat> excuse me. I find I, I find I have advanced from my first entry level DSLR crop sensor camera to an intermediate DSLR crop sensor camera rather quickly. And I'm unsure if I should further advance to a full frame DSLR or maybe look to purchase a mirrorless camera, which I'd also need to purchase new lenses for. Yes, there are plenty of YouTube videos with pros and cons, but I was interested in your views. Lana, I'm happy to help out. So I advise that you don't buy new. Um, in fact, because you're now at the intermediate DSLR level, then you just roll with it. There's no sense in buying a full frame. I'll, I'll preface that though. Hold on, just, just hold on until I finish. You don't need to buy a new camera. You don't need to buy new lenses. Your intermediate DSLR, whatever it is, I'm not sure what it is because you didn't mention the camera maker model. However, there is only one reason why I would ever advise someone to go out to the thousands of dollars to go to a full frame system if they already have an APS-C size system with lenses, okay? And it's this, if you are making money through wedding photography, portrait photography, um, what do you call it, uh, child, I guess you call it family photography, and what else, fashion, okay? If you're making money with those genres of photography, then yes, I would definitely invest in a full frame camera system. Now, why do I say that? Mainly because the full frame camera system allows for a greater amount of depth of field blur. So when you choose your, your smallest f-stop number, we would say wide open uh, for the lens, that's other terminology, then you're gonna have a really beautiful and very strong depth of field effect, that blur effect behind the subject, and that would be the person's face. Okay, so I would definitely advise that if you have the budget, if you're making money. However, did you know that landscape photographers are often better served with APS-C size cameras because there's more depth of field sharpness ability because a smaller sensor, like the APS-C size sensor compared to the full frame, will allow for greater amount of depth of field sharpness, both in front of the camera, directly in front of the camera, and all the way to infinity. In fact, you may, sometimes people say, well, Mark, why 
is there so much depth of field ability in my iPhone compared to my DSLR? Well, the iPhone sensor is smaller. The smaller the sensor, usually what happens is more depth of field sharpness is, uh, is uh, permitted, not permitted, but is showcased in that photo, okay? So that's my advice for you. I don't ad ever advise people to spend thousands of dollars just to get you know, that full frame sensor unless they have a, uh, an economic reason to do so. Great question. Okay, thank you, Lana. Mike, by the way, sorry about the creaky uh, chair that I'm on. I'm gonna have to get it oiled. Mike, how do you know when your picture is finished? How do you know when too much is too much or not enough? I usually have, let's say, a normal picture and then I can't decide what to do with it. That's such a great question, Mike. And I think this, in the world of editing, and especially even in the world of painting, I know a lot of painting painter friends, artists, who always wonder, has the painting been finished or do I keep on adding detail? And that is such a subjective decision that um, I can't really answer. However, I will give you some advice, is that when I'm doing editing on a photo, I will edit the photo the way I think it should look in Photoshop or Lightroom. And then I will wait an hour or two or the next day before I present it to the world. And that that waiting period, going back, I might say, oh, you know what, I, this is over-processed. This is, this is way too much. It's getting into the realm of, um, you know, unrealistic. It doesn't look good. And then I will back off those edits and sort of uh, present that photo probably in a better light. So this waiting period could be, like I said, a day. It could be five hours, two hours. And it's really effective because we don't usually have the ability to judge the final product after with just one session. At least that's in my case. Now, there are exceptions. For example, in my street photography, I don't do any, any um, touch-up work. It's just black and white. I do some cropping and some um, tonal adjustments. That's true, but they're quite minimal. So I am able to get my um, street photography out to the world on Instagram and Facebook um, pretty much as soon as I edit it. However, more involved pictures like landscape photos or portraits or anything like that, it's something you do want to take a, be concerned about because especially if you're into portraiture, if you're doing weddings or something like that, and you do skin smoothening, you could make that person look like a Barbie doll with ridiculous looking smooth skin. That's why you go back and test it out, okay? So we don't want to go overboard. And that's why I advise that waiting period. Okay, Mike, thank you for your question. And um, what I'm gonna do is maybe three or four times a week do these Q&A sessions, mainly because I'm at home during another COVID restriction phase. And uh, of course that is never good, have a COVID restriction phase. However, it is for our benefit um, and it allows me to do Q&A sessions. So what I get you to do is to subscribe, hit the notification icon or the bell icon and the notifications, and that will tell you when I do go live to answer your questions and put your questions for the next video I do below here. So any photography related questions, just let me know and I'm always happy to help. Okay, so I'm going to end this for today. I'll see you either tomorrow or the next day, depending on when I get to the next video. Bye-bye.